Today we're talking about the history of the CNE, the Canadian National Exhibition. The Canadian National Exhibition opened along the shores of Toronto 140 years ago in 1879. The fair we now know and love has revolved around the area south of King, just west of Dufferin, west of Strawn, and south to the lakeshore for well over a century. But the origins of the X predate this. In the 1840s, the city was very different. Queen Street was named Lot Street. The population was somewhere around 20,000 people. And the Toronto Maple Leafs wouldn't win their first Stanley Cup for another 70 years. Toronto would have its first large exhibition in 1846, right around here, the King and Simcoe area. Firstly, let's back up. A broad history of the CNE needs to be looked at from a few different standpoints. Where it is, its origins, the development of the fair, its architecture, and what it's meant to the city the country, and us. The CNE stands upon what is now known as Exhibition Place, which is traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. This rectangular stretch played a strategic military role during the War of 1812, World War I, World War II, and still retains some military presence on its east side. Dozens of Americans, British, and Indigenous people died on or around the current CNE grounds during the Battle of York. Fort York to the east, as well as the Stanley Barracks buildings, still standing. Now the history of the fair, some say, actually shadows the history of both Toronto and Canada themselves. The exhibitions in Toronto that predated the CNE were hugely successful, yet it wasn't until 1879 that the city, after much lobbying and fundraising, finally launched a permanent and yearly fair named the Toronto Industrial Exhibition, now named the CNE, the Canadian National Exhibition. Now, over the history of the 140-year fair, many different incarnations have happened. It started out as an agrarian and industrial fair, and over the following decades and century, it turned into what it is today, something modern and contemporary. The opening year was three weeks long and saw over 100,000 attendees. It was housed in the newly leased exhibition grounds, over a 50-acre area, the current space now being over 190 acres in size. What has to be understood is that the exhibition we all have gone to for decades is something extremely different than before. The Toronto Industrial Exhibition served numerous purposes. It showcased the city, the province, and the brand new country. What we as Canadians were capable of was on display. The CNE introduced people to the electric railway, phonographs, wireless telephones, radio, television. For decades, the fair was the largest in North America, and briefly, the world. By 1912, the fair would change its name, and the Canadian National Exhibition was born. The argument some people make about the fair shadowing the history of the city, province, and country is a fairly strong one. Agrarian origins in a small town, a growing size and exhibition developing into a more cosmopolitan feel, cows being traded for engines, the erudite costuming being traded for newsboy caps, the introduction of rides, dancing, and the weird. Over time, the exhibition took on what to many would resemble closer to a circus. Elephants, water skiers, men on fire diving from heights, and what was known as freak shows. Now the exhibition grounds where the CNE is also played a large role in Canadian military history. With the beginning of World War I, the city and country began mobilizing. The area revolving around present-day Liberty Village and the exhibition grounds played an immensely important role in the war effort. Liberty Village housing tens of thousands of largely women building munitions and the newly named CNE grounds training the soldiers. Here is a photo of the old Dufferin gates guarded by Canadian soldiers. Training, living, deploying, and sadly, mourning. The interwar years showcase new technology and everything Canadian, but it was not to last. With the onset of World War II, the grounds took on, yet again, an important role. Soldiers trained and lived on the grounds. Even many of the Maple Leafs players were stationed there. Following the war and yet again, the exhibition resumed. The post-war years were fairly prosperous. The scope and look of the fair would change. Change in lockstep with the country itself. During the off-season, the fairgrounds began putting on more and more events. Exhibition Stadium housed everything from the Grey Cup, 
to concerts, to the RCMP musical ride. The latter half of the 20th century saw the expansion of the grounds, an exhibition stadium taking over the role formerly that of Varsity Stadium on Bloor and Maple Leaf Stadium on Lakeshore. In 1977, the city finally got a Major League Baseball team. The Toronto Blue Jays took over Exhibition Stadium after the southeast corner was, awkwardly, built into a baseball-suited structure. The mistake by the lake, as it was known. The city loved to hate the space, but loved it nonetheless. The first home game for the Blue Jays? In the snow against the White Sox. The Blue Jays would switch over to the Sky Dome in 1989. Exhibition Stadium would fall into even more disrepair and would be torn down in 1999. In 2006, BMO Field would be built on the space. Soccer not being new to the space though, the Toronto Blizzard played home games on the grounds in the 1970s and 1980s. Now the CNE is actually Canada's largest fair. It's the sixth largest fair in all of North America. It's far bigger than both the Calgary Stampede and Vancouver's Pacific National Exhibition. Now this 140 year old fair brings in over 1.5 million people every year. The CNE currently adds somewhere around $90 million into the GTA economy, employs over 5,000 people, showcases countless vendors, products, and entertainers, and to many, the most important fact, it feeds people some remarkably odd things. The Toronto Industrial Exhibition and CNE has played an immensely important role in Toronto architectural history. It's hard to describe how many different, unique, and often grandiose structures have come and gone from the grounds. The fair has always been meant to portray Toronto as important, powerful, and modern. The architecture of the space was, to some extent, its primary means of doing so. Arguably Toronto's most iconic building sat on the grounds. The Crystal Palace was built for the earlier fair in 1858. It sat slightly north, around King and Shaw. When the permanent fair started, the building was moved south and added to. In the late 19th century, many grand buildings were constructed on the space. Sadly, all are now gone. Predominantly built of wood, many perished in fire. When the Government of Canada began helping with the funding of the exhibition in 1902, there was a conscious decision to start almost from scratch. The majority of the large stoic buildings we still see today are a result of this era. The building campaign saw the building of 15 permanent buildings designed by architect G. W. Gwynlock from 1903 until 1912 including surviving press building, horticulture building, government building, music building, and the police station, Fire Hall. In 1910, the main entrance to the fair was crafted with a new gate, the Dufferin Gates. Until the construction of Princess Gates on the east side of the fair in 1927, the Dufferin Gates acted as the main entry point. Here are some passengers arriving down Dufferin in 1929. The gates would stand there until their replacement in the late 1950s with the creation of the Gardiner Expressway below. The 1920s saw a sweeping addition of new buildings. The Coliseum, which now houses the Marleys, the Ontario Government Building, which now houses Liberty Grand, and others. 1936, the band show was created, still heavily used to this day. The post-World War II era brought in a series of modernist buildings. The Food Building, Queen Elizabeth Theatre, the Shell Oil Tower, and the fourth incarnation of a grandstand, after the third one burnt down, again. And from the street, that's all you could see. Tonight only, Michael Jackson. The human eye couldn't see the teensy letters above the name which said, the Schmengi's salute. Only a fly on the marquee could read that. So Since then, things have largely stayed the same. Modern additions were added to some, and with the Toronto Indy Race moving in in 1986, the Shell Oil Boulevard Tower was taken down. The 1990s saw a shift towards year-round sustainability, and long-term leases were given to Liberty Grand and Medieval Times. The Intercare building was constructed, and the beloved Flyer roller coaster was sadly demolished. Now the fair has meant many different things to many different people. For some people it's all about the food. For others it's about cute dates and rides. For me, it's actually about the tiny little donuts. The CNE has been around longer than any living person in the world. It's played a large role in the lives of every Torontonian and still to this day continues to bring enjoyment to the young and old alike. 
The space along the water has helped the Allied forces win wars, introduced the world to gizmos, sporting events, rock concerts, and definitely some pretty weird food. Let's go to the X. Let's go to the X. So much at the X. Let's go to the X. So much to see for the whole family at the X. Let's go to the X. Let's go to the X. So much at the X. Let's go to the X. So much to see. To see any is the X. Today we're talking about the history of something that marks the end of summer, sadly, except it's awesome. C&E, super neat. <laughs> Go to it. Um, now the history of the C&E holds different memories for everyone. For some people it's the history of food, for others it's where they went on dates. Prior to that it was agrarian and industrial, showcasing both Canada and Toronto itself. For me, I like the donuts. Are there donuts? Is that a thing? <laughs>